Take God's word and find Mark chapter 2. We'll be in Mark's gospel. And I praise God for a good roof and a dry place to worship the Lord this morning. But find Mark chapter 2. Last week we began a new series. We called it Show the Way. And it's all about God using you as someone who will step up, be the one, and show others the way to Him, to be saved, to have a personal relationship with Christ. I want to speak to you on this subject this morning relating to that, Extreme Measures. The title of the message is Extreme Measures. I went to Extreme Measures to win Carrie's heart. I mean, I, I watched I watched her come into the certain wing of the, the building there at Union University where we were supposed to register. I saw her, and I was there to help her register for school. Uh, later, I invited her to help me go buy some, pick out some jeans. I needed some new blue jeans, so we went to the mall. I mean, I took extreme measures. Before that, I was driving back from preaching a youth camp at Panama City Beach, and I had heard that she was, uh, for a friend of mine that had introduced us, because uh, we, we ended up marrying sisters, but anyway, uh, hit, my friend said, well, hit, she'll be with my dad and, and my brother at, at their church in Birmingham, and she's a summer intern. So I engineered it where I would go right through there and stop, and I didn't announce myself. I just walked right into the church office and uh, there she was. She'd gotten up late that day and didn't have any makeup on and didn't have, she still looked great, amen? But I took her out and we picked out Father's Day cards for our fathers because it was that time of year. And, and uh, later, uh, I, my friend kind of organized it. Do you want to go to Opryland? Carrie's going, of course I want to go. And, but, look, but her parents were going too. Awkward. It, but I, 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 there I was in Opryland. How many of you remember Opryland? It was a good place to go where there were rides. And I tell you, we, we, rode, we rode chaos together. Did any of you ever ride chaos? It was a roller coaster, but you sat, one person sat right in front of the other one, basically in the person's lap, right there on the bench. And, and the thing about chaos is you had to hold on tight, and it was in the dark. Awkward, but anyway, but uh, no, I didn't. I did. I wasn't even hoping for a kiss, uh, but I just, I just, um, it was, it was a good, it was a good time. I went to Great Links. You know why? I was captivated by her. I was ca captivated by her reputation as a godly person. But mainly, she was just really hot, amen? So, and it still is today. And so, I was, my heart was so captivated that finally I went to even greater lengths. I got a diamond ring and put it on her finger. I went to extreme measures to win this woman's heart. I was captivated by her. Let me ask you three questions this morning, thinking of extreme measures. Are you captivated? Are you captivated by Jesus? Read with me about some people who were captivated by Jesus. Mark chapter 2. And again, he entered Capernaum after some days, and it was heard that he was in the house. Immediately, many gathered together so that there was no longer room to receive them, not even near the door. And he preached the word to them. Then they came to him, bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. And when they could not come near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. So when they had broken through, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven you. Now, you, you get the picture here. This is a crowded home. Most scholars believe this was Peter's house or Peter's mother-in-law's house. Why the crowd? The word had gotten out. And Jesus, in fact, had healed Peter's mother-in-law. 
And the word was out, and so people were gathering. They were crowded in, and, and you've been in homes like this, and you've been in venues like this where you come in and you think, I'll just step in and, and watch. I'll just step in here into the back of the room and watch, and there's, there's not even room to do that in this home. And here come these four men with their friend who could not walk, and they couldn't even get close. And so they went on, up on the roof and they tore the tiles off the roof and lowered him down. I would say they were captivated. Are you captivated? Are you captivated, firstly, by his healings? His healings, you say, well, I've never seen a divine, miraculous healing, Pastor. Well, I don't know that, that I've seen one right in front of me. I've seen God answer some incredible prayers. But these people had heard about Jesus' healing. They had heard about maybe the leper Jesus had cleansed. Now, there, there were some people in Europe years ago, and there was a man that was the leader of these people. In fact, he's the namesake, the school that he started, the school of thought, that is, is a namesake. He's the namesake of it, Rudolf Bultmann. And he started the Bultmannian school, which sought to go through the Bible and quote demythologize the Bible that is take out the things that really didn't happen so they said but I want to remind you that Jesus dealt with someone who was a doubter he was a disciple in fact his name was Thomas or he was called he was a twin and he was called Thomas and after Jesus dealt with them he looked up at the rest of them and he described you and he described me. He said, you have seen me, Thomas, and therefore you've believed. But blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And the Bible says, and truly Jesus did many other miracles that couldn't be written in that book. But those were written that we might believe that he is the Christ, the son of the living God, and that by believing we might have life through his name. Jesus had had a disciple doubt him. That disciple had touched his, his scars, hit the hole in his side, and then he had knelt down and said, my Lord and my God. And then Jesus went on to describe you and me. Blessed are those who have believed and they've not seen. I've not seen the resurrected Christ. I've not seen Jesus raise up someone personally, literally, who could not walk. I've not seen any of that, but I want to tell you, I believe the miracles in this blessed book. I believe that he fed the 5,000. I believe he healed blind Bartimaeus. I believe he cleansed the leper. I believe he healed Peter's mother-in-law. I believe he healed the man at the pool of Bethsaida that could not walk, that was, that was totally... Uh, inept to, to get up and put himself into the pool. I believe in all the miracles of the Bible. What about you? Are you captivated by his healing? You see, these people gathered at this home because they were captivated by the healings of Jesus. I believe in all the miracles of the Bible. I hope you do too. Are you captivated by his teaching? Did you notice what it said? It said the last phrase of verse 2, they're all gathered, there's no room, and it says, and he preached the word to them. Jesus got them all around, and he preached the word of God to them. Are you captivated by the words of Jesus in this book? I know I am. I mean, the Sermon on the Mount, uh, after Jesus taught all of those high truths, which were the correct interpretations of the very misinterpreted Old Testament at the time, the Bible says they marveled, they were astonished at his teaching. Why? Because he taught as one having authority, not as the scribes and Pharisees. See, Jesus didn't come off as a hypocrite because he was not. Je Jesus taught and there was, there was life in what he taught. He was, after all, the ultimate author of what he taught and originator of what he taught. And he even said of his own words, my words, they are spirit and they are life. Oh, I know there's been 
some other so-called testaments of Christ. But at the end of the book of the Revelation, which by divine providence was placed at the very end of our Bibles, it says, if anyone takes away from this book, he will be taken out of the book of life. And if anyone adds anything to this book, the plagues of this book will be added to him. Listen, if it's new, it's not true. I don't need another testament. I don't need another revelation. I've got the inerrant, infallible Word of God. It's a revelation of Jesus Christ. It's perfect without any mixture of error for its matter. It is the inerrant, infallible Word of God. This book doesn't contain the truth. This book is truth. This book doesn't contain the Word of God that we've got to ferret out and constructively criticize and see what's authentic and what manuscripts might be the ones that reflect Him. No. It is the very Word of God. Is it captivating your soul? Are you captivated by His healings, by His teachings? They were. They were there sitting around. But then they were interrupted, weren't they? They were interrupted. I I wonder about those people that were sitting right under where that guy was lowered down. I wonder if if one of them or more looked up and got some things in their eye and they were trying to to get their eyes clear. I wonder if one of them, if maybe a dirt clod bounced off their their head. I wonder if they, they quickly got out of the way and pushed people out of the way. The Bible doesn't tell us. I mean, this was a place you could have had a, another injury. It was so crowded. But here these men lower their paralytic friend, their handicapped friend. And Jesus, it says, saw their faith. Jesus saw, now Jesus can look into any heart, but I believe the scripture is referring to the evidence of their faith. Jesus said, these guys are willing, they're willing to do, they're willing to do whatever it takes. They're willing to go to extreme measures to get their friend to me. And Jesus looked at him and said, son, your sins are forgiven you. Now, I don't think this means that he didn't have personal faith. I think he had to have personal faith. Number one, because the whole of the Bible teaches that you're not saved by the faith of someone else. You're saved when you put all of your trust. Listen, you're saved. Your spot is reserved in heaven. Your sins are forgiven when and only when you put your personal trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. When you depend only on his finished work of Calvary to cover your sins. When you abandon all self-effort and ritual and status. And you say, Jesus, it's only a gift of your grace and I'm trusting you. This man allowed his friends to take him. He could have said, no, you're not taking me. I'm not going. He could have rolled off the mat on which they brought him. But no, he was there. I mean, think he had to cooperate a little bit. You say, well, what a picture of lostness. And yes, it, it, when you're lost, you can't save yourself. And, and no matter who you are, no matter how moral you are, no matter what your upbringing is, this man couldn't heal himself no matter what sort of therapies he may have had and, and remedies and doctors he saw. But he, he, he was hoisted. They walked up to a roof and they lowered him down. He cooperated. But look what happened. And the question is, are you captivated specifically, I'm going to change it, not just by his healings, not by his teachings, but both of those point to something. Here's what they point to. Listen to me. They point to who he is. Are you captivated by his identity? Look what the Bible says. Verse 6, and some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts. Why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they reasoned thus within themselves, he said to them, why do you reason about these things in your hearts? Jesus is reading their minds. He's reading their heart. Their problem's just not in their head, it's in their heart. They don't believe in his identity. Why do they say he's blaspheming? Because Jesus said, I forgive sins. And they're thinking, he's he's making himself equal with God. He's blaspheming. 
Jesus says, which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven you, or to say, arise, take up your bed and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, arise, take up your bed and go to your house. And immediately he rose and he took up his bed and went out in the presence of them all, praising and glorifying God. Now listen to me. It is harder, I believe, in a sense, to forgive sin than it is to heal someone. Let me explain what I mean. Really, they're not mutually exclusive. If you can do one, maybe you can do the other one, maybe. But there are people who can mimic healings. And think about this. All sin that was forgiven before Jesus died on the cross was forgiven because Jesus would die on the cross. But everyone who was healed was not healed based on what Jesus did on the cross. God can heal anybody. God can heal a lost person. Did you know God heals lost people? He does. You, 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 the, all the time. You, you say, well, I don't know if they were really healed. If God removes his staying, sustaining hand of common grace from any one of us, from any person on this globe, they will cease to be able to live. God is the sustainer of all things, of life itself. But it is easier, watch this, it is easier to say, Carol, your sins are forgiven you. Because you can't see. You can't go look at her and say, Oh, let's see, are your sins forgiven? Oh, let, let's, let's check you out here. No. It's easy, it's easy to say that. But Jesus said something very curious. He said, is it easier to say that or to say, get up and walk? Rise up and walk. And it, he said, so that you will know that the Son of Man has power to forgive sins on earth. I say to you, man, paralyzed man, rise up, take up your bed, and walk. And he did. What Jesus was saying to those those people that were sitting there and aren't there some like this in every group they're just filled with criticism and that the, the, and to be and to be frank they're they're not really part of the group they're not really putting they haven't had a personal experience with God through Jesus and the Holy Spirit they've not had that but they're here and they're they're, they're just looking around and and I, I hope it was a dirt clod that hit one of those guys in the head. I just can't help but hope that. But when Jesus said the Son of Man, they as scribes, in other words, they as experts with what had been written in the Hebrew Testament, their ears would have perked up because that is a title only for Messiah, given primarily in the book of Daniel. Jesus was looking at them, saying to them, listen church, and proving to them, I am no less than the Messiah of Almighty God. I want to ask you this morning, are you captivated by his identity? Are you, does he have your heart? Do you have him in your heart? And if you, if you do, if you do, then you're also captivated by his activity in your life. Look at the last verse there, verse 12. The last phrase, we never saw anything like this. <laughs> I mean, most Baptist churches need a good dose of that, right? You know, they say things like, we've never done it this way before. But I like this one better. We never saw anything like this. They were amazed. Are you amazed at what God's doing in your life? I mean, think of the disciples. They're not even all called yet. He's going to call Matthew after this point. But just think of them. Andrew, Peter, Bartholomew, James and John and Thomas and Philip and Alphaeus and Simon the Zealot and Judas, not Iscariot, but also Judas Iscariot. But think of them, think of them as they walk with Jesus for three years and he works, not just his works his mighty works, not just his signs. And they hear his teaching, but not just his teaching, but he works intimately with them. Did you know God does that for us today through the Holy Spirit of God? Paul wrote to a church at Philippi, and he said, it is God who works in you both to will and to do 
of his good pleasure. Listen, here's what we're offering people. We're not offering them religion, dead religion. We're not offering them membership in an organization. We're not offering them simply fire insurance to evade eternal punishment, although that is part of it. We're offering them a personal relationship with the very one who created them. Amen? And, 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 and he saves you, and, and a lot of Baptists especially. Yep, I'm saved. I got baptized. Check, check. Now I'm just going to go on my merry way. Well, listen, if that was real, he's still working in your life. He didn't do the great work at Calvary to save our sorry souls from hell just to leave us orphans. That's why he said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. That's why he sent the Holy Spirit. He's working in your life if you know him. Are you grieving the Holy Spirit? Are you quenching the Holy Spirit? Are you too busy? Listen, people are too busy today. Because I guarantee you that this thought came into some of your heads. Well, I don't know if he's working in my life. Well, I don't recognize where he's working. I'm confused. You need to be still and know that he is God. You need to sit at the feet of Jesus, as it were, in your life. Are you captivated by his healings, by his teachings, by who he is, his identity, and by what, listen, not, not what he did 30 years ago. Praise God. I love that old song, Brother Rusty, where you list the days of the week. It happened on a Monday. Somebody touched me. It must have been the hand of the Lord. How many of you grew up singing that? But I had to always stand up on what day? Glory day, because I have no idea what day I was saved. But what I'm saying, I'm not saying don't rejoice in what happened then. Rejoice in what happened then. But I'm asking you, what's happening now in your life? And listen, if you're going to go to extreme measures like these guys did... It's not going to be something you can work up or drum up or discipline yourself to do. It's going to come from an overflow of your life, walking with Jesus. You, because, you're, listen, your heart is captivated by him. But here's a second question for you this morning. Are you compassionate? It, 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 it needs not to even be said that these four men were compassionate. Amen? I mean, they took off work. They carried their friend. You know, they didn't have ambulances back then. They didn't have wheelchairs back then. They carried him. They were compassionate. There's two parts of this. Do you recognize hurting people? Are you compassionate recognizing hurting people? They recognize this man's hurt. This man needs help. Can I tell you everyone's hurting? You know, some people, you sit out there and you hear me preach. And you think, if the pastor just knew what I was going through, or if my, my family member, or my friend, or my Sunday school teacher, listen, what you may be going through may very well be the worst that anyone's going through in the entire city of Memphis. I doubt it. I don't know. But it could be. It is possible. But let me just say this to you. Everyone, at some level, is hurting but specifically, I want you to think about people that don't know Christ. People that don't know Christ. You see, they're not only hurting, watch this. They're helpless. Are you compassionate for the hurting and for the helpless? They can't save themselves. They, they can pray, but it's just bouncing off the, the ceiling. It's not getting anywhere. They don't have a relationship with God. They're lost. They're unregenerate. The Bible speaks of the new birth. They've not had the new birth. They've been born once. They've not had an experience with Christ. They need forgiveness. Give me church members full of compassion, and we'll see ministry and multiplication. Why? Because when you have people with hearts of compassion, you will have evangelism. You will have, and that's, and here what's evangelism? Bringing people to Jesus. We don't physically bring them to a physical Jesus. We bring the good news of the gospel to them, and that's how we bring them to Jesus. 
You know when you bring your friends the gospel message, when you bring your friends and acquaintances to church, when you send them a book, a Bible, a gospel tract, when you love them and share with them and they do get saved, you know what I believe Jesus could legitimately say to you? I believe he could say this to them. I believe he could say, your sins have forgiven you because their personal faith did not come in a vacuum. It did not come divorced from your personal faith and your compassion. If I can just get them to see that Jesus loves them, they'll be saved. And Jesus can look, at, look and say, or I guess a commentator could look and say, when he saw your faith, he said to your friend, your sins are forgiven you. Again, your friend has to have personal faith. But he's not going to have personal faith or she in a vacuum. Some people say, well, I'm just not gifted. Jim Henry and Jay Dennis said in their book, Dangerous Intersections, 11 Crucial Crossroads Facing the Church in America, quote, the affirming element about ministry is that any Christian qualifies. In other words, if you just recognize people are hurting and helpless and you know Christ, you can be one of these people. You can be like one of these guys that lowered their friend down on the cot. Good news. You don't have to have the body of Arnold Schwarzenegger, play golf like Tiger Woods, act like Mel Gibson, sing like Bruce Springsteen, or have hair like Fabio to be used of God. God's selection process isn't based on bucks, brawn, or beauty. Amen and amen. Are you available? Do you just have a heart of compassion, recognizing hurting people, recognizing helping helpless people? Think about it. You, you say, well, I guess I feel sorry for them. Think about this. They don't have something you have. You've been forgiven. When you lie down at, at night, you don't have to pray, Lord, I pray my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake or whatever that is, I pray the Lord my soul to keep. He's keeping you. He's got you. No one can pluck you out of his hand. You, you don't have to wonder where you stand. You have the forgiveness of God. He sees you as holy and pure without blemish and spot. If you were to die before you wake, you would be instantly in the presence of Jesus. Do you have compassion for them? Are you captivated by Jesus? Here's the last one and I'll be finished. Are you committed? Are you committed? I don't have to reread this to draw your attention to the fact these men were absolutely 100% committed, weren't they? They get there. Oh, I, we're sorry. It's just too crowded today. Or maybe they, they woke up like this morning and they heard, Hey, would you go tell, you know, tell him not today it's raining. No, they were committed. I mean, they, I, I guess they were a little bit, had some ingenuity about them. I think probably one of them looked up and the other one looked up. They looked at the crowd spilling out. A couple of them, oh, what are we going to do? The other one caught the other one in the front's eye, said, are you thinking what I'm thinking? He said, oh, buddy, yes. And there they went, and there they started to dig. That dig, and, and I'm going to tell you, they probably took it out of their paycheck to pay for that roof repair, too. They were committed. Are you committed? No matter the cost, no matter what it takes, in this same book that I, I really referenced back when I wrote this sermon, they asked this question, uh, and this is the thought is committed, church is committed to see people saved. Churches that are not going to fall into this complacency and this sort of this spiral of decline and death. They asked this specific question, what are the characteristics of it'll do churches? In other words, it's, it'll do It'll do. Let me give you a few of them. It'll do churches cut corners, compromise, and take shortcuts on details. 
such as sparkling clean restrooms, beautiful nursery facilities, a swept parking lot, nice landscaping, immaculate floors, and clean walls. It'll do churches have pastors who present poorly prepared messages because they have been so busy taking care of other things that they didn't have time to get into the Word. It'll do churches have music that's not the worst. It could be, but it's not the best either. It'll do churches react to problems instead of responding to needs. It'll do churches are often critical of other churches that are attempting to do great things for God. It'll do churches have Sunday school teachers who teach the quarterly instead of teaching the Bible in a practical way to help people face life another week. He's not saying don't use the quarterly. He's saying don't just read from it. It'll do churches, they don't invest in lay leaders or train or development opportunities. It'll do churches are content to be the size they are. It'll do churches often see numbers as something unspiritual. It'll do churches use the cost factor to justify why things aren't being done. Let's not be an it'll do church. Will you not be an it'll do person? Would you be committed no matter the cost? And here's the last part of that. Would you be committed? Are you committed to none other than Christ? Is he not Lord? Does he not deserve our absolute commitment and beyond that surrender to the Lordship of over our lives? Let me just conclude. As we prepare for National Back to Church Sunday, would you, instead of leaving and saying, oh, that was a good sermon or well, I, I heard that sermon before. He preached that back in 2014. Would you leave with a, a, an action item list? Would you leave with some, some thoughts scribbled down or typed into your notes of your phone of, hey, I've got an idea. I need to talk to this person. I need to invite them. I need to rekindle my relationship, my friendship with, with her, with him. Would you be intentional? Would you be scheduled? Would you be accountable? Would you be bathed in prayer? Would you have an action item to reach people, especially for National Back to Church Sunday? And then what about you, O oh person that has never met Christ? You, you see, the, these men, they could have allowed obstacles to keep them from bringing their friend to Christ, but at the same, by the same token, there are often people themselves that allow obstacles to keep them from Christ. Charles Spurgeon listed several. He said, indifferent, these are the obstacles for people being saved. The indifference and lethargy of sinners. That is, people just don't care about spiritual things. Maybe your friend doesn't care about spiritual things. Maybe you don't. Doubt, unbelief, delay. Well, go ahead and be saved. Just don't be saved today. Despair. Well, God just doesn't care about me. He helps other people, but he doesn't help me. Worldliness and influences. What will people think? Whatever the obstacles are in your life, if you don't know Christ, you need to move past those obstacles. You know what God did? He became a man. He became a helpless babe and was born into this world and lived a sinless life and died on that cross and rose from the grave so that he could spend eternity with you. He went to extreme measures. 